Good evening, everybody, and welcome to this edition of the MLB Podcast. So right now, it is Monday, the 11th of December, and the winter meetings have just started today. So, no moves have been made in the winter meetings just yet, and there's a lot of potentials. This is only day one. Last year in the winter meetings, we had Chris Sale going to the Red Sox. We had Adam Eaton going to the Nationals. A lot of stuff happened in the winter meetings last year. This year, not much has happened. Of course, rumors have been reported. Multiple things have happened, but here we are today. So, it's hard to believe, but about a month ago, I went on the air, and I said, Giancarlo will be traded. Everybody knew that. There was rumors. And at first, I thought the favorites were going to be the Cardinals or the Giants. And neither one of those deals happened, and we'll get to that in just a minute later in the show and other stories that went around the league were for one Shohei Otane who is 23 years old signed with the Anaheim Angels or Los Angeles Angels that's what they used to be called and we'll get to that in a minute as well but those are the two big stories right now no other stories have happened just a quick side note I'm not going to go into it the Atlanta Braves which that broke that story broke about a week after I last went on the air, where John Cupolello was fired, and not only fired, was banned for life for uh, a scandal where they're signing international prospects, 16-year-old, 17-year-old, Dominicans, Venezuelans, at, really, they agreed to a deal before they're eligible to sign, which is a huge scandal, and what the MLB is doing is basically trying to make sure that never happens again. So the Braves, basically, for the next three, four, five years, basically cannot spend any international money, which they cannot sign Otane due to that. So, anyways, let's go to Shohei Otane first. Let's talk about that. So, what the story is, so he's Japanese, he's 23 years old. And being 23, last year the MLB CBA put out a rule where when you're 23 years old, or less than 25, you have to go under the international signing rules, which I don't think make, makes much sense due to the fact that he's under the same rules as, say, a 16-year-old, 17-year-old, Dominican, Venezuelan, Puerto Ricans, they go in the draft, uh, Mexican, Latin players, plus occasionally you don't see Asians... Koreans, Japanese, they usually play a professional career. So, anyways, there were rules that many teams did not have the $3.5 million that he was going to be offered as a signing bonus. Many teams did not have that. And about a week ago, a list of seven teams came out. The Cubs of the NL Central, which seemed appealing. And then the NL West, there was the LA Dodgers, the San Diego Padres, and the San Francisco Giants, which the Padres surprisingly became started to become a front runner towards the end of the week. And in the NL West, we had the Texas Rangers, who had previously had Yu Darvish, Japanese superstar, as a, as a pitcher. And also, the other two teams were the Seattle Mariners, who they started to become a favorite towards then, and the Anaheim, or the Los Angeles Angels. So, throughout the process, a lot of people assumed he was going to go to the Yankees. That's what people thought. That's what people thought. I thought he was going to go to the Yankees. A lot of people did. I thought that would, that would be a perfect fit for them. You know, just continue the great success that they've had and really put a stamp into their pitching and their hitting, potentially, and really add to what the Yankees are. Well, Otane dropped himself out of the Yankees. I think he said comments earlier, I do not want to be with a Japanese, another Japanese star, which in the Yankees already have Masahiro Tanaka, another Japanese star. So they're out of the equation. Basically, all East Coast teams are out of the equation, including the Washington Nationals, who were possibly rumored to get them. So, factors like that, in the end, Otane chose the Angels. Which, to me, I like that move. For one, the Angels, they don't have much pitching. That's what has kept them away from the playoffs the last three seasons. They've come up short. 86 wins in 2015. Missed the playoffs by one game. 16, took a step back. We're even worse. 17 were in it, were in contention, really until the final week of the season, until the Twins eliminated them. So the LA Angels, 
The factor has been, and quite frankly, throughout the career of Mike Trout, who might be the best player ever when it's all said and done, have wasted their prime, have not built a talented team around them, and Mike Trout is worth a 10 war. Well, when you when you take him away, the Angels are worth 75, maybe at times 80 wins. Less than that, usually 70, 60, whatever. The Angels are significantly worse without him. And that showed when they had their best year in 2014 when they won 98 games. It looked like that plan worked. So what I've heard is Albert Pools being a team guy, being that veteran leader, I've heard is really conditioning, trying to lose weight, get himself into shape to play first base so Otani can DH when he's not starting, and clear cut is number one. So how do you figure that in? Since really, no one, when you talk about two-way players in Little League, pretty much everybody's done it. Everybody's hit and pitched. And then high school ball, look, there can be guys who coming into the draft are clearly hitters and and pitchers are very good at both in the high school level, but that is not the case. Even in the college level, you can see two-way players. And in the end, guys who were hitters in the MLB were very solid pitchers in high school, or pitchers in the MLB were solid hitters in the, at the college level. But once you get to the professional level, that the minors, that means that you are no longer considered a... You can't do both ways, and that has not been done in 100 years. Babe Ruth did that. Actually won 90 games as a pitcher. He's one of the better pitchers in the American League about 100 years ago. Then, And then more and more, each year started to hit a little more, a little more, a little more. And he might be the greatest uh, hitter to ever live in terms of power. Unfortunately, that, I wish we had this. That would have been so great. But there is very little to no f- footage of Babe Ruth as a player. So, But yeah, he was a great one. So anyways, that has not been done in 100 years. And earlier this year, it came out in Sports Illustrated and twice in Baseball America, the number two overall pick in this year's Major League Draft. Hunter Green went to the Cincinnati Reds. They said he could potentially do both. And he couldn't, didn't quite. You know, he played rookie ball. And he he hit some, hit some, but he's clearly a pitcher. And another player, the fourth overall pick, the Tampa Bay Rays did it. Out of Louisville, Brandon McKay, so a very solid pitcher and hitter. And he actually may do both. They let him do both, clearly did, in short season ball this year. And as he gets into the minors and even in the majors, it looks like they'll let him do both. And Otane will do both. In fact, it has been confirmed today that the Angels will let him DH and pitch. So in terms of going to the field, in Japan, played some outfield. May have done some first base. Has not really been in the field a whole lot. And has not been completely durable. And with Otane, people say he's the best player in the world. They call him Japanese Babe Ruth. Well, Trout is clearly the best player in the world right now. Otani is the second best, you know, really sitting at the Japanese level. It's a different league. But let's say he's your ace. So he throws 150, 200 innings. And bats, let's see. He has three days in between starts at times four. That is three to four at bats a game. So doing a full year. And this is the AL. And when they go on the road and he pitches, will hit. So if you put this into fact consideration, he may hit. Assuming he does maximum amount of hitting. Hits, let's see, has three days has three days in between starts, and assuming there's off days as well. So he gets 300, 400 bats a year. So that's about half a season to less than a full season worth of that bat. So we'll see. And if it turns out he just can't pitch at the big league level, just can't pitch, he'll do hitting. If it turns out, you know what, after a few years sites, you know what, I can't hit, then he'll stick to pitching. But if he can consistently do both throughout his career... This would be something. This would be incredible. Maybe this would start a new trend that just keeps happening, you know. And ex- example in other sports in the NFL for years and years as a run game, passing started to evolve in the lat- latter part of the 20th century. Is now part of the game today. Three point shot in basketball didn't exist till about 40 years ago and was rarely used. It was just used as in kind of an extra thing. wasn't thought of much. And then in the last two to three, four or five years, very recently, is now part of the game and continues to be part of the game. Like big men, centers, four or fives, who used to just stay in the paint, pound the post, guard the paint, stay in that area, within less than five feet from the basket now, are shooting threes, and some of them are actually quite good at shooting. So trends happen in baseball. Like the home run, that's a trend. That seems to be going up. The strikeout, that's a trend. They both correlate together. 
guys with a lot of home runs. You can hit 40 home runs and hit 200 and strike out 200 times. That is a trend in today's game. And what I hope, and I don't think we'll be certain, is Shohei Otani creates a trend where you can do both. And I obviously like that idea. I like seeing guys do both. But that's not happened in the major league level in 100 years. So that would be an interesting trend if, say, in five years, oh, everybody does it. Everybody who we draft, everybody who we do that, we they do both. And maybe it would be a bonus if they could do both. Or in a few months after this year, does it just die out and Otani is just a pitcher and he's a very good inning pitcher. But this is a trend that dies out. So we'll see how that goes. You know, I'm excited to see the Angels. Like I said, if you have the MLB TV app, it's late at night. You know, obviously competition with the Dodgers could be a lot of fun to watch Otani and Mike Trout at the same time. Definitely a lot of fun to watch. So there you go there. That happened right before the winter meetings. And it was a process. And look, and there's another factor. So as I mentioned earlier, he went under the MLB signing bonuses, international rules. So if you go back, if you would have waited two years, he could have gotten up to two to three hundred million dollars. He was worth that much. And that move, he decided he wanted to play in the MLB so badly that he was willing to sacrifice tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of dollars to play in Major League Baseball instead of playing two more years in Japan. He showed he wanted it. And what I assume is going to happen is you look at the contract details. He's not going to play in the majors at all. In fact, uh, MLB Pipeline, which is the uh, ranks all the minor league uh, prospects, instantly ranked him number one. So I assume he's going to play for the Angels for about six years. So he'll be a free agent after 2023. And we'll really see how this unfolds. And it'll be about 28, 29 at the time. And who knows, could make... 400, 500 million. So this is all very exciting. This is all just very interesting. Just one of the better stories in Major League Baseball. I really hope he stays in the league a long time and really changes the game. And this this is great for the game of baseball. And I I like that move by the Angels. I'm glad he went to the Angels. You know, he could have gone to the Dodgers, could have gone to the Padres, could have gone to the Cubs. And another reason why he did this is look at all the AL West teams, they were clearly the finals. The the Texas Rangers, the Seattle Mariners, and then Los Angeles Angels. The reason why is they have the option of the DH. Now, if it's in the National League, it would be interesting. How do we put this guy in when he's pitching? And where do we put him now? And now you have the DH. That's what he's going to do. I don't see him playing in the field. But I like that move by the Angels, and I hope it works out. So another big story. And I went at, when I went at this at length a month ago, and I spoke on the 12th of November. So what I said is, Stanton, could he go to the Cardinals? Could he go to the Giants? Well, reports came out that he went to the Giants, or was traded to the Giants. Of course, he had a full no trade clause. And by the way, currently has 10 years and $295 million left on the contract. Can opt out after 20, so if he's in New York, where he is right now, if he opts out, he can possibly get four hundred or five hundred million dollar contract. He he can do this. So, anyways, he says no to the Cardinals. Good idea, well run system. They have been winners in the past, but the way they're going right now, the Brewers seem, seem like they have a brighter future than them. The Cubs seem like they're there to stay. It is hard to tell. The Cardinals are kind of in the middle. Like the past two years, they've won eighty five, eighty six games. Have been in the playoffs until the final days of the season, really into the final weekend, and they just couldn't quite make it. Their team's not quite good enough to do that. First time since 07 08 that they missed the playoffs back-to-back year. So anyways, turns down the Cardinals. And the Giants, who lost 98 games this year, once you're there, you don't know how long you're going to be there. You don't know what situation you're going through. And, and San Francisco said no. And an interesting report was put out, since when you have full Full, full no trade clause. What you can do is, you can decide one. Do I, here's a trade deal. Do you approve it? You can say no, which that would stand, which that's what Stanton did to the Marlins, or no, to the Cardinals and to the Giants. Said no to them, and preferably wanted to go to the Dodgers. Wanted to go to the Dodgers since he went to high school, Sherman Oaks High School, about twenty miles away from Dodger Stadium. Wanted to go there. But 
they couldn't quite reach out a deal to go there, and that's that's who seemed the favorites were to be. And the Marlins basically, this was tweeted by Jeff Passion of Yahoo Sports, basically said, if you don't accept these trades, you're going to be a Marlin for life. You're going to be a Marlin for life. Of course, could, could have opted out after three years and stuck it out there, but went to the Yankees since they were the best fit. And here's the thing with the Yankees. They got Stanton. Well, you already have Aaron Judge. And you had, one, two guys with 50-plus home runs. Stanton, 59. Judge, 52. That's 111 home runs. Which, if they were to do it, that would be the first pair of teammates hit 50 home runs since Mantle and Maris in 1961. Which is not surprising. The same year... Maris hit 61, a record that we did not think would be broken. And it has been broken since twice. But in, anyways, so Stan can clearly hit 60 home runs. Now he's playing all these years in Miami, right? All these years in Miami. One of the bigger ballparks in the league, and it managed to hit 59. Now when you're in New York, you can hit over that short porch and left. In Boston, you can hit over the Green Monster. Toronto fields a lot of home runs. So does Camden Yards with the Orioles, the way they play. So, looking at that, he's getting a lot of home runs. I think he gets 60 next year. I really think he can. And Judge, now you can't ask someone to peak. If he peaks at 52 home runs and he hits numbers considerably in the 40s and even touches 50 again, I'd be okay with that. I mean, you can't do much better than that. I mean, but you have... The two best power hitters in the game, no doubt, in terms of pure ability, in terms of numbers, in terms of stack cast, like how far they hit it, can hit home runs upwards of 500 feet. They have as much power as anybody in the game, and you put the two best power hitters, possibly their generation, I really think so, when people have compared Judge to John Carlos Stanton, they're both huge, about 6 feet 7, two of the biggest players to ever play the game, and they're playing together, and... Judge was the MVP finalist, did not win. And Stan won the National League MVP, which is the first MVP, people have said, to be traded since A-Rod in 2004 when he very nearly went to the Red Sox. I was called off and went to the Yankees. And believe it or not, his contract with the Yankees has just expired. So for the first time since uh, 2003, the Yankees are not paying him. And he's not under major league contract. And no... Wow. But anyway, so anyways, that's the way it is right now. And you also have Gary Sanchez. The lineup's going to, they're, they're going to get a lot of home runs next year. They're going to get a lot of home runs. They might break the major league record for most home runs. Yeah. And the Yankees didn't give up much at all. In fact, their prospects did not give up any high-end prospects. For an example, of Glaber Torres, who would have debuted if it weren't for that elbow injury he had last year. And the Marlins, really, for them, what it was, was a could have been, when you saw who they gave up, it's, they were more of a salary dump. And now they do not have to pay the biggest contract in MLB history, which I assume will be surpassed this up, next offseason, about a year from now. So, here's a scenario I thought about. Could Bryce Harper still go to the Yankees when you have Judge and Stanton? Let's say Stan plays left, Judge plays right, Harper and center, or Stan can DH. So that's that's probably the way it'll be. So it could still happen. It's a possibility, but think about that outfield. You could have three guys who could hit 50 home runs, or certainly 40 plus. Harper is more than capable of it. That could be very interesting. And look, the Yankees are going to be scary. They're going to be scary good. Next season, they, their farming system is great, still top notch. Yes, they gave up a few pieces last year to get Todd Frazier and Sonny Gray, guys like that, but their farm system is still top-notch, and they have next year's spending class, and we know the Yankees are capable of spending. They have as much spending power as anybody. They're here to stay. They're here to stay. So that's the deal. I like that move. I like Stanton going to the Yankees, and I liked how the Yankees did not have to give up too much. So when the Marlins did this, Now, their farm system is still terrible. Since the guys they got from the Yankees are nowhere near good enough to even move their farm system up even 
a spot or two. So it's 30 right now, moves them to 28, 29, not even good enough to do that. So what they have to do is, and I've thought about this for weeks and weeks, and I, when I heard the Baseball Tonight podcast of Buster Only, people on today are saying that's what they have to do. They have to, from normal, numerous sources, you have to trade their salaries. And yes, they do. You need to trade Boar, Real Muto, Prado. You got to trade Prado. Certainly Ozuna, which I've heard rumors of him being traded in the next coming few days. Cardinals seem like the biggest favorites to land him. You need to trade Yelich. You need to trade all these guys. You need to just start from the bottom, like what the Houston Astros did, what the Chicago Cubs did, what the Washington Nationals were eight or nine years ago that led them to getting Steven Strasburg and Bryce Harper. You have to start at the bottom. They need to just blow it up. And time and time again, they've had young stars come up. We saw that with Hanley Ramirez and Giancarlo Stanton. And eventually, they became superstars for them. Stan got the huge contract. Ramirez never did. And they're all, at some point or another, traded. They've never been able to have a winning season. They've not had one since 2009. And they've not. And they've made it to the playoffs twice in their history. 1997 2003. Both the times they've won the World Series. The other 23 years, they've missed the playoffs. And not to mention, they once had Miguel Cabrera and traded him to the Tigers. So looking throughout their history, they have failed most of the time. They've failed to put a winning team on. They have failed to win games. And once again, they've lost talent. And they're under this new regime of Derek Jeter and Bruce Sherman, the new ownership group. Jeter really makes a lot of the front office decisions. And it will be really interesting to see what this team really does. And I said, you need to get rid of that payroll. You need to Get at the bottom, and with all those trades they do, it's not going to make their farm system from 30 to 1 overnight. I mean, example, that last year was what the White Sox did. Their farm system was in the 20s. They got it up higher. But with all these moves, their farm system can improve significantly. They can get, make it a mid-level team or even in the upper level. And hopefully they make good draft decisions. In the few, next coming years, they make good international signing decisions. And they're really in form to win games. And that is a long ways away. Throughout the rest of this decade, we have two years left in this decade, believe it or not, 18 and 19, in comes 20, the early 2020s, they're going to be bad. They're going to be bad. And they have to deal with that. And for their fan base, it's obviously be even more painful. They, they got that new stadium. They signed Stars. They signed Reyes. They signed Burley. They signed Heath Bell. They had a Still had Hanley Ramirez and even younger Giancarlo Stanton, only 22. And people thought there was promise in this organization. They had Jose Fernandez come up, who unfortunately tragically passed away a little over a year ago. This Christmas, 15 months to be exact. So what that meant is they just had so many unfortunate bad luck happen to them. And now once again, they're going to have to push the reboot button, start all over, and this fan base is going to have to go through another painful rebuild that in 2013, we remember the Marlins, we lost 102 games, and to make matters worse, since 2013, they have made terrible draft picks, they have missed on all their draft picks, Tyler Clock, the number overall pick in 2014, Resulted in Tommy John surgery. They believed he could throw 102. I was excited to read about him then. At the time, through Baseball America, I thought he, I thought that could be a great pick. Has yet to reach high A ball. He might not ever make it to the majors. Could go down as one of the biggest busts ever. Josh Naylor, they drafted a Canadian power hitting first baseman out of Canada in 2015. Eighth overall pick. Was traded to the Padres a little over a year later. And Braxton Garrett, who they drafted... Eighth overall, once again, a pitcher from Alabama needs Tommy John surgery. So looking at all these picks, it looks like they've missed three, four years in a row. They've not done a good job of drafting, which results in a poor farm system. Guys who you think are your next piece. So the Marlins have not run their farm system very well. They've done a poor job. They are they have no incoming assets. Even now with Stan gone, I would advise them, and they have to do this. They have to 
just blow it up, get rid of every major piece they have. We know very likely that Ozuna's out. They just need to keep going and not stop. They just need to start over and we'll see what happens. And is this just another cycle of maybe this will work, maybe this will happen, but it's been a long Long, very frustrating fan base. You know, the least pop, the least team I'd want to be a fan of in Major League Baseball is the Miami Marlins. So we'll see what. So we'll see what happens. Another story that happened about a month ago, month and a half ago, and I spoke about at length a month ago. So Joe Girardi was out, which still that, that's a move that I still wish they would have kept him, and he would have stayed the manager. He deserved to be managing. I don't know why they let him go. But they did, and that, that might be a move that I might, no matter how successful their next manager is, which I will say that name in just a minute, I will always think, what if they kept Joe Girardi? Joe Girardi's always deserved to have this job. So, it was a long process, and it happened just about a week ago. They have hired Aaron Boone to be their manager. So, Aaron Boone, who had a solid career, most famous for winning that home run in Game Three of the 2003 or Game Seven of the 2003 ALCS to beat Boston to send them to the World Series, and then had a knee injury that resulted in them in getting a rod, and had a pretty good career. But his most famous for that home run was a broadcaster for the past eight years of ESPN. And I heard Aaron Boone's press conference today, and what he said is. Being a manager, he really started thinking about the past few years and covering postseason baseball, really covering baseball. He said he was thinking like a manager. He was thinking, what are they doing? Do I agree with this? Do I disagree with this? He was really thinking about it and had no managerial experience whatsoever, never managed in the minors, was never a college-level coach. And it came down to he was the one picked to be their manager. And if you're Aaron Boone, look, look. There have been a number of managers. If you're Ron Garner, we got hired by the Tigers. Terrible situation to be in. That could get you fired in the next couple of years. And that and that happened to a number of managers. Choosing to be the manager of the Phillies. The Phillies open job. Some of the jobs are, are managerial opens are clearly better than others. And Aaron Boone has the best one you could get. I mean, your team lost in Game 7 of the ALCS. And you're put in charge of this team. That is ahead of schedule. I thought they'd have. A, I thought they'd be this year. I thought they'd be worse than they were last year. I thought they'd make it to the playoffs this year and maybe lose in the first round. But they're in position to go to the World Series, and and, and they have the best odds to win the World Series. And and they can go to the World Series. They really can. They can win the World Series this year. They can win it next year. They can be baseball's next dynasty. They can get thirty World Series titles by the early part of the next decade. And there's no and there's nothing stopping them. And what this means is you have the keys to let's say this is a could be a Ferrari, could be a Lamborghini, whatever. You have this luxury, just special thing, you know, you got the best manager job you could ever get in those circumstances. And he could be that guy the Yankees have brightest about a brightest future as anybody in that game in the game and what they decided to do in the 2016 season. They're old and they decided to make some moves, trade their older players, do stuff like that. And it has clearly worked out great. And now they can be world champions this year, next year, the year after that. It, there are unlimited possibilities. And Aaron Boone has been granted that title for his first managerial job. Now, many managers, remember Joe Torre, when he was hired by the Yankees 22 years ago, he was fired by numerous teams, was fired over and over again, and people said, clueless Joe, well, they won four World Series. So this is not a manager getting another opportunity. This is not a manager who has had success before. This is a manager who is getting his first experience, and he can nail this, be another Hall of Fame manager, have another number retired in Monument Park. This could happen. This could happen. This could be something special. And also, another Yankee news. Brian Cashman has been extended for five years. Value worth that approximately $25 million, $5 million per year. So now Brian Cashman is going to oversee 
in the operations of Aaron Boone. They're committed, both of them long term, which Brian Cashman has been here now for 20 years, has won four World Series, has seen all sorts of stuff, has seen Jeter pulled off the A Rod deal years and years ago, has done all sorts of stuff, and has always seemed to make the right decisions year after year. And this Yankees team is complete. And I've said it many times, I'm going to say it again, they're baseball's next dynasty. I really think they'll win the World Series this year. But it's hard to say. And they're not done yet. They have 2018. They just have so much left to do. So, a lot of news happened with the Yankees in the past month and a half. John Carl Stan, I'm glad that deal's finally been complete. And for approximately the first five, six weeks of the offseason, nothing happened. Almost nothing happened. Of course, a few minor moves happened. Brandon Morrow, or that's a pretty big move, is going to the Chicago Cubs. So they bring in that eighth inning guy who Carl Edwards last year seemed to have really lost in the playoffs. So that that's giving them an, an insurance. And they've also signed Tyler Chatwood from the Colorado Rockies to be there. He'll be in the rotation next year, so some minor moves have happened. And tomorrow is when I think some major moves will happen. I think a lot will happen in the next week, um, next month, even two months. A lot's going to happen. And it's been quiet so far, but so much more is going to happen. And hopefully at some point next week, maybe Saturday, Sunday, Monday, some point in the next week to two weeks, we'll try to come back on the air and Talk about what happened in the winter meetings. And that is it. And the NFL season currently, week 14 has been completed. We, we have just three games left to play. The playoffs look to be secure for some teams. Other teams, it is far from over. So that will be very interesting to happen. You know, for the next month and two months, we'll start to become go more on the air, especially in January for the NFL. So thank you for listening, and we will see you next time.